This session is part of a webinar series which aims to assist researchers, librarians and institutions in the adoption of digital tools and persistent identifiers for a significant increase of research discoverability globally and to increase efficiency in scholarly workflows. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our webinar series on open science for the discoverability of African research. My name is Martha Chikuni, a content manager from Ubuntu Alliance. Afri Archive is a community-led digital archive for African research communication. By enhancing the visibility of African research, we enable discoverability and collaboration opportunities for African scientists on the continent, as well as globally. Today, we welcome our speaker, Ashley Farley, from Bill and Melinda Gates. And she will be speaking on the topic, a research funders open access policy. Before we dive in, just a bit of a background about Ashley. Ashley, Ashley Farley is a program officer of knowledge and research services at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In this capacity, she leads the foundation's open access policy, implementation and associated initiatives. This includes leading the work of Gates Open Research, a transparent and revolutionary publishing platform. Much of her work advocates for knowledge to be a global good. She completed her master's in library and information sciences through the University of Washington, Washington Information School. She has a deep passion for open access, believing that freely accessible knowledge has the power to improve and save lives. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us today and over to our speaker, Ashley. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna share my slides. Please let me know if everything looks great. It looks great. Okay, awesome. Thank you so very much. And thank you for everyone who's tuning in today, wherever you are in the world. I greatly appreciate it. And I'm excited to share the foundation's open access policy journey. So I want to start with where where we've been. Um, so this is a very high level kind of timeline of where the foundation has been in its open access journey and also pointing out some of the other uh, key major moments throughout kind of the past decade. So when I first started the foundation, we launched our first open access policy. It's been an all grant agreement since then. And it was very much if there was an open access option at the journal, we would pay for it. If not, that journal wouldn't be considered compliant. And at that time, that meant that a lot of what's considered to be the high impact journals uh, didn't have any open access option. So those journals weren't compliant. Although largely it's not where a lot of our grantees were publishing. Um, so the, the impact was kind of on a, a smaller portion of our grantees that have been uh, privileged over the years to um, be able to publish in, in such journals. And throughout this whole journey, the theme of career advancement and kind of um, prestige publishing has been threaded throughout all that we've been trying to do and improve and it's a really tough, tough problem to solve for so that'll that'll come up time and time again. Uh, in 2016, we launched Gates Open Research. Um, that's in partnership with F1000 as a publisher. It's my favorite project to work on. You know, I think it's a really great example of what uh, we could do and accomplish with with uh, you know academic or research publishing uh, with the technology that we have available to us. It's a fully opened post-publication, peer-reviewed platform. And we've been able to do some really interesting things with it and are even growing it moving forward with more of a, a, a preprint overlay. And I'll talk more about that later, but it's it's really, I think, given our, our grantees a good opportunity, especially early career researchers to have a place to showcase their research and get that support. Um, there's no scope for you know discipline or novelty. It's really uh, inclusive and meant to be author driven. So we've learned a lot uh, through hosting Gates Open Research. Uh, in 2018, we joined Coalition S, uh, which you may be familiar with, which is 
or um, more of a global movement of, of funders to align an open access policy. And that policy was named Plan S, uh, which really meant to, to make open access the norm uh, in, in a short amount of time. We joined, I mean, we launched um, the Plan S principle by 2021. It was a very interesting time to try and change a policy uh, during a pandemic, lots of conflicting, um, you know, priorities and attention. But I think, uh, you know, it really was a, an interesting uh, point in time to show why an open access policy was so important and why we really wanted to push more for even broader open science practices. We you know, we were able to do things with with grants and grantees that we've talked about for many years and embracing a more open science approach. Um, but because of the pandemic, it was really, you know, hard to argue against those practices. So we were able to implement them uh, quite quickly. We saw paywalls come down. We saw data flow much more freely. We saw a real focus of researchers on collaboration and solving a problem versus competitiveness. I do worry that we've we've already you know lost a lot of that kind of progress in those examples and um, have kind of reverted back to to the way we were doing things before the pandemic, which I think shows why continued policy changes and and um, you know advocacy is really critical to make the change uh, long lasting and sustainable. Including the time that UNESCO recommendations on open science uh, as a global policy framework, which has been critical. Um, we've seen a couple of years later the push for more diamond open access and different open access models. I think we've also seen um, the subscribe to open model start to take off at that time too, uh, which is a great community group and I think publishers that really do value openness and so they're finding a way to make that happen um, as quickly and sustainably and as sustainable as possible. And then I included the um, the uh, here in the US the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, announced that uh, basically getting rid of the embargo period that we have here in the US for government agencies. So everything that's funded through the US government will now need to be made uh, openly available immediately. This is a, a major shift. It'll kick off in 2026. But I remember when I first started working in open access, um, uh, I would hear a lot that you know if the NIH or if the US government made this change, uh, it could be a real catalyst for a shift in the ecosystem. I didn't think it's something I would see in my career. So it's exciting to see what potential that has. But as we've seen with many kind of open access, uh, many elements of the open access movement, there are of course uh, commercial players and different parties that might try to co-opt that. Um, so still, till, still to be seen the impact it it will have. And so digging in a little deeper, these are some of the things that we've learned over this decade of open access and what we've been trying to to achieve um, with the policy. We started with very low compliance. We've seen that it's risen st steadily, but it's flattened. Uh, publishers are very, very slow to change and of course push back when revenue is, is threatened. And I'm a bit worried that often that compliance is driven by the publishers themselves when they see a Gates funded paper and they know that we would pay an APC. It ends up down that route, no matter kind of what the, the author um, has decided and we I really feel important that you know this should be an author driven experience. We've seen APCs become the predominant business model. And this is you know of, of concern. I think the community has really established that APCs are inequitable. You know, we pay the most expensive up to twelve thousand dollars. We of course know it it does you know cost to to have a publishing activity. Uh, we want to pay for services, but um, we know that kind of the prestige publishing element is really driving up those costs. And we haven't seen a, a lot um, done to kind of mitigate for, you know, the different um, purchasing abilities of researchers across the world. Um, you know, waiver systems haven't been, I think, effective in delivering kind of the equitable component of, of open access publishing. Uh, so there's there's concerns that, you know, we I think there was a paper just published the other day 
um, showing that the prices of APCs for most of the major publishers are outpacing inflation. Uh, so we've kind of created a, you know, affordability crisis and open access at any and all costs. And and now, you know, instead of having a barrier to be able to read and access the information, it's a barrier to publish and participate in a lot of ways. Uh, we've also been, along with the kind of the, our Gates Open Research experience, have been, you know, really thinking about the kind of publish, review, and curate model. Um, as more and more information is published, uh, it's hard for anyone in any kind of discipline to keep up with the information. So how can we leverage different technologies and kind of, um, uh, you know, tackle the peer review crisis as well as another part of that um, to create a kind of different model that is, is sustainable and, and works for, I think, where, where we are with uh, technology and research as a whole. I won't talk too much throughout this round uh, open data, but as part of our open access policy, we've already always had an underlying data component. And to be completely transparent, uh, compliance with that has been quite low year over year. It really depends on where grantees publish. So if it's journals um, that require underlying data be shared or help facilitate the sharing of underlying data, we see strong compliance. Uh, and that's been, I think, a really value add to the publishing process and, and what publishers could really help support. But if we don't have that component, it's really hard that far downstream in the research pro process to have that underlying data be, be shared in a, in a meaningful way. And so we have been doing a lot of work and trying to make sure that that's uh, more front loaded in the grant making and research process. Uh, but there's there's a lot of opportunity to do that, that better. And then uh, we've also learned that, of course, it's it's really important to be able to work with similar funders and really trying to accelerate that change. Uh, I think coordination and policy is really important. We also want to, you know, we want to have that uh, powerful collective action and trying to make change, but also make it easier on our grantees to be able to comply with policies um, and make that that easier. So together we've ignited a tangible change in scholarly publishing, but our journey towards equity and knowledge remains unfinished. As part of our overall mission at the foundation to promote equity for all people around the world, we must work towards a more inclusive future in research dissemination. So where are we headed? So this is our, our vision that we wanna be able to foster a publishing ecosystem that is equitable and inclusive. And so we really think that rolling out a, a refreshed policy will help start to address the inequitable practices in scholarly publishing and hopefully drive broader change in this ecosystem. Um, the policy aims to inspire a cultural shift kind of away from the prestige and, publish, prestige and privilege in publishing to one that champions equity and access above all. So what does that look like in practice? And I will say that, you know, I don't think this is the um, end all be all of open access policies. I do think it's an important shift for us to be able to kind of get out of the, I think, current practices and the things that we continue to perpetuate with our policy, such as paying high APCs or really require, you know, really, um, uh, focusing on the version of record that that keeps us from being able to, I think, experiment and push change more broadly. Um, so yeah, so keeping that in mind that uh, I think this is an important iteration and and what a perfect open access policy um, looks like is is still un unknown to us, similar with kind of those sustainable uh, open access models. So these are the three pillars of what's changing with our policy. First, you know, we, we've had Kind of throughout our policy journey, you know, we very much focused on the version of record when we first launched the policy with Plan S iteration. We did enact rights retention strategy. Um, we did allow for um, you know the self archiving or you know posting the author accepted manuscripts, so the version after peer review but before final uh, typesetting and kind of ownership of the article to the journal. That would fulfill our policy and that has been, um, but we see kind of limited success in, in being able to execute on that portion of our policy. We've seen, um, especially, you know, the large commercial publishers be um, pretty crafty in being able to keep control over that version. So now we are uh, requiring that a preprint be posted. And that's the version of the article that we're looking to be made open access. It's, it's like, 
the what we think kind of the last version of the article that um, authors can have full control over so we can make sure it's openly available uh, with the CC by license. And with that, you know, since we um, know that with preprint servers, uh, there's no cost for the author or the reader uh, to, to use the platform. Um, we saw this as a good opportunity to be able to push back on the APC model and rethink how we, we spend um, uh, our budget on, on, on publishing or open access activities. So we'll discontinue the per article uh, APC or open access fees um, beginning in, in 2025. Um, we are aware that that will negatively impact especially fully open access journals or publishers and we're thinking of of ways to, to mitigate for that uh, but I think it's it's a good opportunity to yeah rethink how we can support the ecosystem um, especially when we talk about equity I really would love to see us you know currently our budget our our um, supports at the foundation are very much focused on our grantees, which in a way it's a you know a privilege to be a Gates grantee to begin with. So how can we use our our money to be able to um, uh, support unfunded authors or other you know researchers globally that that aren't just Gates Gates funded? Um, yeah, and so then that leads into kind of our our, our third pillar is how do we find different and support different models, you know, as Diamond open access seems to really take off, like how can we participate in that? I think it's important to yeah, try to redirect our spend, which right now is going to the top commercial publishers and, and think about how, you know, how what levers can we pull to kind of redistribute that with tech, new technologies? Can we support what um, infrastructure in the ecosystem can we continue to support? Okay. So just covering kind of you know our thoughts around you know or maybe preprints are new to you we know our footprint our preprint footprint is about ten percent right now um, on average we have about uh, four thousand papers per year that site gates funding um, it's a small kind of drop in the bucket of the the millions that are are now published per year uh, but preprints are early versions of the research um, that's made available on a preprint server. It's yet to undergo formal peer review, and that's, um, I know, kind of uh, the most contentious um, part of, of kind of the policy shift, and we've had lots of discussions with grantees, program staff, partners, the community on kind of what that means and, and how, how does peer review fit into this overall. Uh, but the, by, the past lengthy publishing timelines that can delay research, we saw, you know, especially during the pandemic, kind of the the um, impact of that. Um, and we can, again, it's a version that we can be sure that's made openly available with the CC by license. Um, they matter to us because they allow researchers to share their work openly and rapidly at no cost to them. I think it's quite equitable, especially because preprints are journal agnostic. So the research can really be evaluated on its own merit. And I think that's important. Um, yeah, so I think they can provide the most equitable benefit to grantees, researchers, and the scientific community. Uh, we've seen kind of funders and, and different evaluation systems start to really shift and include these elements um, to be cited and built upon more quickly. And I think that's also important to earlier career researchers that often have to show already kind of their impact in the research community and preprints are a way to do that quickly, easily, and affordably. And this is some of the discussions and questions uh, that we've already had and considered just to show that there has been a lot of deep thinking in this policy refresh. We know that there could be unintended consequences. We're trying to mitigate for those and think through this. Um, but overall, you know, we, we want this to be an easy policy for grantees to comply with and understand that it will have to happen in parallel with more of the traditional publishing, which we know is still important for one, career advancement is what we hear the most from our grantees, and then two, for the research dissemination. So we know there's limitations in how um, preprints can be discovered and shared. And we'll talk more about how you know we're trying to improve that. Um, but we really wanna make sure that this isn't overly burdensome. So if you post a preprint, you're compliant with the policy, the version of record does not have to be made open access. Um, and we know that being able to publish in their journal of choice um, is important. And then, of course, there's the question around quality. Uh, right now, you know, we think, one, this is impacting 
uh, Gates funded grantees uh, who've already been through a lot of vetting that we work with quite closely. So we have high trust in, in the outputs and those being published. I also think there's a lot more interesting uh, research being done right now that's showing that preprints are able to quickly address misinformation, uh, that having you know a broader scientific community being able to uh, comment on, on papers uh, is really important. We're also doing some work around making uh, more automated checks and systems available, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And then we're always continually encouraging our grantees um, to understand why retaining copyright is important um, and really building upon that reuse and really having authors and the research community in control of that knowledge and information. And I wanted to break down kind of the equity piece a little bit more. And this is something that I think we're still, of course, working through and thinking through uh, and making sure that it, um, we can action and deliver upon it. Um, yeah, so while we aim to achieve equity within open access publishing and our policy, there are potential unintended consequences until I think more of the ecosystem can shift and change. Um, there's you know, concerns that this might create more peer-reviewed content behind paywalls and more open access. So how do we you know, mitigate for that? And how do we deal with kind of that issue? Um, and then I've been thinking more that, you know, I think we often look for, especially open access and its policy itself to be able to solve for a lot of the inequities in broader research culture. And those really need to change as well. Um, and the foundation is is working on this as well, but you know, as we need to change funding, hiring, promotion, access, and sustainability of research tools. Those also need to change in order to eliminate more equities that then happen downstream with publishing. But I think it's and it's really important to me that it's, it's necessary to stop doing what we see um, is kind of keeping these systemic issues uh, around. So you know, valuing. Uh, publishing in specific journals just based on prestige and brand um, using faulty metrics. So I think it's important to stop doing that because if we wait for kind of the perfect replacement, we're never going to change. And then I really do think that we need to listen more. And I think we hear is often, um, you know, the foundation being in the global north. I'm located in Seattle, Washington in the U.S. Uh, and I think we have a lot to learn from other uh, countries and communities, and we should uh, not assume that we know what is the best solution, but be more inclusive and listen. So that's something that I've been working on. But moving forward and looking at, you know, what can we do from an infrastructure standpoint is I think that's important. So um, as far as like preprint servers go, we, we uh, link to the ASAP bio directory um, as far as you know, what we consider uh, preprint servers that are available to the grantees, we really want them to decide. I think we have grantees that'll continue to post in preprint servers they're familiar with. Um, as I said, we only have a 10% footprint. So preprinting is new to a lot of our grantees in different disciplines. And so we want them to you know, find the preprint server that works best for them and be able to support that. Um, but then of course, we're as a funder then trying to track where those are uh, especially to you know assess compliance, but also the impact of of our research and where um, where it's being used and published. Um, yeah, so that's that kind of publish side and then review. We're working on different ways that we can help uh, bolster review, especially of preprints. I think you know that's important. While we, we want to be careful not to replicate the current system, and we know that there's already a limited capacity for peer review, I do think there's a real need to reimagine it, make it more broad. Uh, we've um, funded Rapid Review's Infectious Disease, and they've been reviewing um, foundation-funded preprints, and also then um, uh, building a community and help teaching peer review to early career researchers. I think that's really important. And we also support pre-review, um, uh, which is a, a great organization that uh, similarly helps build up the awareness and capability of, of what peer review should look like and leveraging preprints for that, I think is really exciting. And then the curation piece is, of course, really important. Um, you know, to think about indexing and, and discovery of preprints, you know, we're trying to see if we can get these indexed in, in PubMed as a funder and what that might look like. And we know that's probably one of the biggest um, 
pieces that our grantees really need is ensuring that discoverability. Um, but it's hard, and I think index indexers have a lot of power in this space. Um, and it's hard to, to do anything a bit differently if they won't accept different kind of published uh, papers or preprints. Um, it, it, can, it can really then create a, a gap in, in, in what we're trying to see the information be serviced. So we announced earlier this year that we are launching Vericive, which is a preprint kind of option on top of Gates Open Research. It's available to our grantees. It's one option out of any of the preprint servers that they would like to pick. But there's a couple of reasons that we went this route. One is leveraging technology that we already uh, host and 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 um, have, have built upon um, with our grantees. It's integrated to our uh, grants management system so we can easily tie the preprints back to the original uh, grants and and uh, funding source which should be a lot easier um, in this ecosystem than it is but it's actually been very hard for us to be able to track back and so when we talk about uh, personal identifiers or um, you know, like DOIs and, and PIDs for uh, research. This this has been a major uh, uphill battle for us to try to improve that that those linkages and tie back to our system. So the fact that this is already done is great to see. It's going to do about 20 different checks, both kind of automatically and also human led. Um, so we kind of create what we're calling a verified preprint. We'll have some badging. So this is, you know, kind of experiments and 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 what we can do to kind of bolster the trust in um, the preprint um, and give our grantees a good experience in doing that. So I think it'll help uh, ensure comfortability of preprinting for those that are new to it. Yeah, and so just talk briefly about the importance of PIDs and discoverability. So for us, from a foundation perspective, like tracking grant outputs is really important, not only for reinforcing policy requirements, but to try and evaluate that impact and see where the research goes after we're, we've been done funding it. Uh, there's, uh, and then, you know, um, there's a really cool, I was introduced to this project recently, the Africa Research Connect, which is an interesting way to try to leverage AI and create kind of a, a database of connecting, you know, researchers and, and research together. And it's, I think, one way we're able to do that is making those connections built off of PIDs. More and more information is being published. So there's, you know, a needed increase to track versions. And, you know, and that's one of the things I think we grapple with too, is if we're, we're pre-printing and we're allowing preprints to be updated and what does that look like? And there's different versions and we get kind of the record, can we get a record of versions or versions of versions? You know, as a librarian, my back, you know, my from my perspective, I'm like, all the more information, the better. But it does end up creating a lot of um, can create a lot of noise in the ecosystem. And so, what are the ways that we can make those connections stronger and easier for the consumer? And then funders are beginning to use DOIs for grants to be able to improve that tracking output, and uh, we've been watching that space very closely. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there, but it's it's also hard to, again, make change in this ecosystem where you have so many different parties involved that, you know, we need then grantees to be aware of that DOI and to use it in publishing. And I'd like to see, you know, we are very interested too in tracking data more effectively. So how do we make sure that any of those identifiers get used and passed down to make those those connections and make the ecosystem stronger? And I will stop there. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was quite an insightful presentation. I've learned quite a lot on the open access policy itself and just appreciating the work that the foundation is doing um, to advance open science. Um, right now, I'm going to open the floor to questions. Um, if, everyone, if anyone has questions, you can post them in the chat. Uh, right now, we have a question from um, Bavi Thrak. I hope I've gotten the name right. So he's asking, I think the publish review curates and preprinting models would be more meaningful with greater emphasis on the concept of curation. Does the Gates Foundation plan to support innovations around this concept in the future? Yeah, fantastic question. Uh, yeah, I think we we definitely could. And um, I, I tend to be very kind of 
anti-journal at times when, when I talk about like the future of academic publishing. And I think, you know, the articles container of information kind of no longer serves its purpose. So how do we think past that? But I, I often neglect to really do highlight that the cure, curatorial part of it, the community building that a journal can provide um, and that editorial um, perspective and support is really critical. So I would like to see and how, you know, and we can support this, uh, what would that look like in a different model? Like how do we, I think the curate part is going to have to still be leveraging that expertise, which is often, in my opinion, undervalued in the current models. Um, you know, often that's not a paid position. Um, uh, a lot it happens behind the scenes. You know, we don't get to see editorial reports. We don't get to see um, uh, peer review reports. So a lot of that expertise is kind of locked away. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of open peer review. Um, and then, yeah, thinking of how could we build innovations and, and curations on top of that. Um, I would love to see too, you know, how do we, yeah, leverage the, the community in a broader way that it's already kind of doing this work, but it's just not surfaced well. And I think we're, we're in a pretty early stages of rethinking, you know, Right now, our, our budget for these things, we spend about six million per year on, on APCs. Uh, we're committed to pay for the rest of what's submitted in this year. And no, it'll take some some time for us to, you know, uh, wean off of, of using the budget in that way. And then, yeah, then we can we can pivot. And again, I, I want to focus on, you know, supporting services or groups that the entire research community could tap into potentially, or at least not just Gates funded uh, grantees. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here from Joe. So Joe is asking, what are the Gates Foundation views and responses to criticism and skepticism around the preprints um, with quality assurance? Yeah, yeah. So that is, you know, that is a, a big one that we are getting, I think, um, our our response is, you know, one we're we're starting within, you know, from our policy perspective, it's it's Gates funded grantees, which we already have a high level of, of trust in. Um, um, we are building Verichive, which you know is one option, and I think we can hopefully learn from and scale kind of more of the automated checks. Um, I also think that you know as we we continue to we need to continue to address the career advancement is that often is what is causing a lot of the um, um, unintended consequences of having you know misinformation out there um, but but from our perspective you know we have high trust in what our grantees will publish uh, we want to foster the um, kind of peer review component of preprints or the checks or what we can do to mitigate for that. We're also closely following the, the research that is, you know, showing that um, that the preprints can be just as strong uh, or can be addressed much more quickly as as traditional publishing. And I know a lot of that is coming out of the COVID pandemic where we saw, you know, yes, there were some harmful preprints posted, but there were also harmful um, articles that went through peer review. And so hopefully this will give us an opportunity to um, build better tools and ways to react and address um, mis and disinformation. But um, yeah, we're, we're confident to, to make a move in this direction. And thank you for, for that, Ashley. And then we have another question from Nuhu. Um, and they're asking, do you provide any support for local journal to enable them to go online and visible? Uh, currently, we don't, but that's something we could definitely explore in the future. Um, I, it, yeah, I don't know if you mean like a, existing uh, journals or, or new journals, but uh, this I think is kind of tied to what we would like to get to with more of the diamond model. Um, so how can we, uh, you know, subsidize uh, journals or publishers in, in the diamond format where it doesn't cost to read or publish. Um, and I imagine, you know, if, if we're supporting that, that has to include the technology and infrastructure to make sure things are online and discoverable. 
um, I think it's, you know, it's early days for funders to be able to see how we can fund and pay into that system. Um, Cause I, you know, I don't think it's feasible to think that we'd be able to flip all publishers and journals to this model. Um, but it's certainly showing that it's working for really community led localized journals. So how could we better, better support that? I think um, we're in the early days, but it's definitely possible. Thank you so much. Great questions. Um, you, we can keep the questions coming. If you'd like to ask Ashley directly, you can uh, you can raise your hand and then you can get to speak to her directly. Um, Ebuka, do you have any questions for us, for Ashley rather? Um, I saw a hand up just now. Okay, I see um, Obanga Mina's hand is up. So Obanga, if you can unmute and ask your question. That would be fine. Can you hear us, Banga? I don't. Okay. Um, while we wait for him or her to, you know, ask the question, I can just ask the next one here. So thank you very much, um, Ashley, for all of the updates as regards um. um you know, Gates Foundation's open access policy. So I want to ask this question, um, how does the foundation ensure that research outcomes and data from projects in Africa are effectively disseminated and accessible to local communities and researchers? Yes, thank you. Great, great question. Um, I think, you know, from, from the kind of open access publishing standpoint, like that's one of the reasons too that we started Gates Open Research. And one of the first things that we heard was a lot of um, our grantees um, in Africa weren't necessarily on the academic publishing track, but just wanted to make sure that their communities were able to access the information and knowledge that they wanted to share more broadly and easily. And so we actually launched a, uh, um, a, a non-peer reviewed site of the platform. So we've had that since like 2017, I believe. And that allowed for, you know, our grantees to be able to host community guides, just information that wouldn't traditionally be, um, you know, enticing or published in, in a more academic journal that they could share directly with their, their communities. And I think that was an important start. Um, and then we're able to kind of see you know, where that information is being used and, and hopefully it's reaching the, the local communities that um, need it most. I think that's hard, often hard for us to track. Um, and I think then in, in general, the foundation is making some important shifts to make sure that we're supporting more localized. And typically I think we've had a funding um, mechanism where we fund a lot of, you know, institutions and organizations that then have sub grantees that are actually on, say, the ground in Africa doing the work. And now we would like to fund them more directly. Uh, we have, um, if we look at where our LNIC grantees, the, 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 you know, how the percentage that we actually fund directly is quite low. And that's something that we're working on improving. And I think through that, we'll also, we'll be able to have better insight into how we can make sure that that information is getting to where it needs to be. I think data is a really hard one um, for us to, to solve for right now, because uh, we often, you know, as much as we encourage and have structures and, and, you know, the underlying data policy, we're seeing there's major gaps in ensuring that the data is stored somewhere that may not be open, um, because that might not be possible. There are a lot of sensitivities around data. But even knowing where it might be stored or be accessible has been a major gap. And we're trying to see, you know, how can we support infrastructure that uh, we can tell grantees the data is at least it's here or you can host your data here. Um, so there's there's a lot of work to be done there. OK, thank you very much. Um, let me also ask as a follow up to that question, is that um, part of the reason why you're setting up very archive? I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, that's, that's one option. I mean, that's, you know, it could be, um, I, st I still think that that might not get to the more localized use. And also we've had a lot of requests to 
have gates open research and then you know vericive um you know be able to support other languages it's not something we do well um, mm -hmm. um so i think you know i don't i don't think that's going to be the the best solution to start but hopefully you know we can we can get there um yeah okay all right um thank you very much i see um i saw somebody else is hand up i think obanga is having a okay is anybody speaking? Oh, Banga, are you able to unmute? Yes, I'm so excited. I'm able to unmute. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Ashley. It's, it's been an incredible, incredible learning experience for me. Two questions, real questions on, um, I don't know how much you do with Nigeria and the academic um, space, you know, because um, with all I heard today, I kept on asking my colleagues, are you people aware of this? Are you aware of this? And they're like, uh oh, we don't know. Maybe it's, you know, there, there usually has to be a call and then an expression yeah. and then uh -huh, and then participation. So I just felt but maybe we just haven't got to see that because um, there's so much out here going on, and we were we are struggling a lot in the uh, you know down south, and a lot of people are doing things on their own, publishing on their own, printing, doing everything, even carrying out research. So I mean, I don't know how much we have gone with them exploring you know a wider reach for Africans, especially in West African institutions like my institutions uh, of learning. And I don't know if um, you know that is where your strength is, or it is in a contemporary area like the civic space and uh, all the other professional areas. Otherwise, a lot of us here, I mean, so far, none of us, of course, have been grantees, you know, so yeah. that already put us as excluded from, yes. <laughs> from when you continuously said grantees, we were like, none of us are grantees. <laughs> so we need to be, you know, so it'll be great it would be great to understand the modalities, you know, one of participation, one of inclusion. And if we can have this kind of session with my institution, because they kept on saying, can we have a session like this to discuss with um, academic staff on issues like this? And I mean, it, it, so many questions were going around as we listened to you. So, so, so inspiring. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, thank, thank you. No, those are, are spot on points. Um, yeah, and I would, I'm always happy to, to host sessions. Uh, but I think, yeah, that that's something that I, you know, as we crafted the new, the new policy, it just becomes more and more clear to me that, you know, we have been in the past decade really working in that silo of like Gates funded. We get probably three to five requests a day from unfunded authors to cover the APCs. So there's, you know, there's a, a huge need to to shift that, and that's why, yeah, I want to see how can we can use this this funding to more support the broader activities. I also think there's, um, uh, there's be like we we don't work closely enough with institutions whether we fund them or not. Uh, I think especially in the publishing space. Um, so I think there's a huge opportunity there that I'm not quite sure what is the, the best way to fix that. Um, I know, you know, Europe is it further ahead because they have more of that connected network and consortium here in the U.S. We don't have a lot of that. And then from the U.S. perspective, I'm not sure how to tap into other countries. So, um, yeah, but would would love to be able to do that, have more of these these discussions, have a better understanding. Uh, we the foundation has opened um, another office recently in Africa. So I'm hoping that as we stand up those more regional offices, that'll give me the opportunity to connect with those and understand better what is happening in those communities. And that was a real reason why the foundation has shifted in, in that direction is, you know, not relying on having the central Seattle office really manage all of the grants and the strategy, but leveraging more localized expertise um so yeah i think lots of lots of opportunities there yeah thank you very much for those answers ashley um i think um, i can also see colin's hands up or oh, i think he said she has a question colin's colin's chisita can you ask your question now You can unmute and ask, yes, thank you. Oh, all right. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to the presenter there. Um, my name is not really a question, but it's more like a comment and uh, mm -hmm. maybe 
it's, it's mine is more like a comment and a search for a little bit of clarity. I see your initiatives, they are in line with uh, uh, what people like uh, Arnold Schwartz, uh, you know, fought for. Uh, when I was reading the Gorilla Open Access, Open Access Manifesto, where you, um, you emphasize the need to democratize uh, access to scholarly uh, research and um, to dem demolish paywalls uh, and ensure that uh, uh, those who cannot afford um, access in some way they have some means of being able to access uh, scholarship that is scholarly content. Uh, is this what you are focusing or aiming to achieve as well? Yes, yeah, def definitely. And I think, I think, I, I don't think maybe our next policy iteration can accomplish just that, but I think it can stop us from continuing what is not going to accomplish that. So uh, the payment of the APCs as we've been paying them, um, uh, you know, we're getting a lot of criticism right now for stopping those those payments, especially for authors that that can't afford them. And I completely understand that criticism, but I feel like, you know, if we continue to pay twelve thousand dollars per article or even the more reasonable fees that I mean, many are just priced out of that system and it's just going to continue to uh, perpetuate itself until until we we stop and, and take a stance against that. Um, yeah, so that is that is definitely, especially personally, that's that is my my goal, and I feel very lucky to be at the foundation to be able to leverage the foundation, um, you know, the foundation's uh, impact in the world to be able to to try and achieve that. I I don't know if it will with this policy, but I I do think it's an important pivot at least to get closer closer to those those goals and. Um, and especially, you know, the, we were still a part of Coalition S. Coalition S is, I may have seen, launched the kind of towards responsible publishing the work. And I think that is also the aim of where, you know, we really want to see the research communities uh, take back control of, of the, the research and of the dissemination of the research and, and leveraging and harnessing that expertise. Whereas I, I think just so much of that has been uh, unfortunately commercially co-opt and it's not getting any better. Yeah, because I find it ridiculous that uh, you pay for an article to be published so that you can read your article. Yeah, and and you know, I you know, I'm still very interested in in libraries and library community because that's where I you know spent most of my career up until now. And you know, the the subscriptions and serial crisis hasn't been solved. Libraries are still facing increasing fees. That's why you know, with Plan S, we um, we didn't we didn't you know pay hybrid journals for a while, but. That's been you know, difficult to execute. Those journals aren't flipping to open access. Transformative journal program ends this year. So there's a lot of, you know, we've done a lot over the past decade to really try and, and you know, be, I think, business model agnostic and try to shift everything to open access. And I think we have a lot of learnings of what isn't working to be able to stop doing those things and, and to try something different. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Collins, for your question. Um, Marta, um, as soon as I'm done asking this next one, maybe just take over from here. Um, there's also another question, Mirella, I'm um, sorry, Ashley, from Mirella Dolaj. And she says, um, thank you, Ashley. I wanted to know what was the feedback from more established long career researchers regarding this new policy and overall, how you can think researchers can be made part of this process. I hope yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it's, it's the feedback that we've received is kind of, um, I think it, it exists on a spectrum. So if you have the more senior career researchers that, you know, have been through the current process, and I think this, the, the feedback that we've received the most has been very global north centric. Uh, so caveating with that, 
they they know there's a lot wrong in the system currently and and are happy to see any change happen and so in, embrace it and think it's 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 a good move but then we have kind of the flip side of that where um you know, those that don't see that the system needs to change drastically, think it's a bit too risky and, and too soon, um, which we, you know, definitely hear and take into account. But, you know, preprints have been around for a long time. You know, we have a lot of data behind our current policy and experiences. We have a lot of research and in the inequities of, and the affordability, <coughs> affordability crisis of open access um, to drive decisions. Uh, I think early career researchers really want to see things change but i know they're in uh, you know they're not in the position to really advocate for that change senior researchers are but they're also not and and i think it's it's hard for me in this work to really reconcile the fact that many are calling for change in in just academic publishing um more broadly and of course you know open access we really need and want to see that change but then you know don't don't don't, don't want to see anything shake up at the same time. And it's, it's just, I think, an interesting conflict that we've had in this space for decades where, you know, if we're waiting for kind of the perfect change in solution, um, it's, it's not going to happen. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Would you like to say anything? I think I saw you. You're trying to type something. Oh, Mata? Mata, you can take, take it up from here. All right, wonderful. I think there's another question from um, Milera. She says, I wanted to know what was the fee. Oh, it's the same question. Sorry for that. It's been taken already, yeah, I think. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Yes, I think I have one more here. Um, maybe right. Ashley must have um, touched on it while she was um, talking, but if she has, Ashley, I would want you to retreat. So it says, um, in what ways does the foundation collaborate with African research organizations and its initiatives like um, Africa Archive to promote open science and equitable access to research findings across the continent? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think this is something that we really need to work on. Um, from my perspective in the where I sit and working on the open access policy, I don't think we have a lot of those connections or that support yet, um, but there might be that I, I might not be aware of them on the programmatic team. So a lot of times, you know, it'll be the programmatic team that's giving the grant or making the connection and ensuring um, that those activities are happening. Um, and I'm sure especially as the new Africa office develops that, the, that those connections are being made. Um, but I think that's a, it's a big opportunity that um, we really need to, to look into. Uh, and then as far as more of the kind of data sharing side of things, I think we're getting better at um, helping and ensuring that grantees include um, kind of the costs within their budgets to be able to make sure that data sharing dissemination or management is happening. Um, and same with any any additional information. It doesn't have to just be, I think that's the emphasis that we're trying to put now too, doesn't have to just be through uh, academic publishing. Okay, thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Ash. Yeah. Um, okay. Obanga is asking, um, she says, how can we work more with the Gates Foundation? Uh, she represents I actually represent in Nigeria as I lead academic research there. So is that possible to work with the foundation? Yeah, I think we could definitely explore the option. I don't um, know if we can, can we share out the, so we have a general open access email alias. It's open access at gatesfoundation.org. I think that'd be the best way right now. We don't have any open calls and typically the foundation and we do have some kind of grand challenges set up, but we don't we don't typically have open calls for proposals. And so it's it's much more of like definitely, you know, building up those relationships and seeing, you know, what what we can um, do and and having, you know, groups build up the proposals and and work from there. So I would love for for anyone to to reach out, especially as we um, kind of shift our strategy in this space. This is new to us.
and I should include that and I should um, in the inf contact information in the slides because that'll be uh, shared out as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think um, Martha is um, trying to resolve one of these things. All right, so yes, like Ashley said, um, the slides will be made available. And um, as she said, um, the contact information will be also um, made available in the slides as well. So we might um, possibly share the slides and the video tomorrow. So look out for that on our various platforms. Um, okay, so does anyone in the audience have any other question? If you do, um, you can just go ahead and unmute. But um, if you don't, I think we'll just round it up here. I see Obanga is that. asking if you are. Hello? OK, yeah, I can hear you. Obanga was asking if you're based in Nigeria. So I just wanted to oh, confirm oh, yes. that he's based in Nigeria. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm based in Nigeria. I'm based in um, Kaduna, Nigeria. Yes. Thank you very much for that. And then we can always connect, yes. So do we have any other question from the audience? I think um, there is none. I think there is none. So Mata, would you like to round it up here or I do that? Anyone is okay yes, by me? Yes, my internet has um, stabilized now. Uh, thank you once again, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Ashley. We've learned quite a lot. This webinar series is co-organized by the Ubuntu Alliance and access to perspectives as part of the ORCID Global Participation. Today's speaker, Ashley Farley from Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, she shared on a research funder's open access policy. We have more exciting webinars and speakers in our subsequent sessions. Our next webinar will be on the 1st of August, um, 2024 at 11 a.m. WAT, 12 p.m. CAT, 1 p.m. EAT with Sonia Barbarossa of Database as our guest speaker. We're looking forward to having you once again. Thank you for being here. See you. Thank you so much Bye. for the participation Bye, and great questions. Bye. Thank you, Ashley. Bye. Bye, Ashley. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.